I'd like to talk about um, allergic rhinitis in the first uh, half of this talk, uh, give you an idea about why some people become atopic and some of the other diseases that are involved in patients who have allergic rhinitis. And then in the second half, talk a bit about um, immunotherapy, which I think is generally accepted as being quite a good treatment, but perhaps not used in the UK as much as um, it perhaps should be. So um, we talk about allergic rhinitis and IgE is the basic sort of um, uh, immunoglobulin that's involved in allergic rhinitis. It's only found in mammals, so your budgie can't get an IgE-related allergic rhinitis. And it's found in tiny, tiny amounts, IgE, compared to the other uh, immunoglobulins. And what's it for? Well, there is a reason for it. We, we talk about allergy. It's not, um, it's not designed to, to make you allergic. It's designed to try and get rid of parasites, so bigger things than our immune system can normally deal with. So it causes a reaction where you itch to scratch the parasite off, makes you sneeze, makes your nose run, makes you cough to get rid of it. If it's in the gut, then it can give you colic and diarrhea to try and remove these, these intestinal parasites. So that's the reason for IgE to be present in our body. So why are some people uh, atopic? Well, clearly an allergy that we're talking about is an abnormal response to something that isn't actually harmful. Grass pollen, dust mites aren't harmful in themselves. They're only harmful when there's an allergic reaction to them. And if you look back to 1900 or so, when you can do skin prick tests just as, as we can do now, the, in, the prevalence has increased massively over the last 100, 120 years in the industrialized world and amongst domesticated animals. And it's still very low, as you can see, in the developing world and in wild animals. So there's been a huge difference in the last 100 years in our level of ATP generally. So is it, is it genetic? Is that why people become uh, atopic? Well, certainly there's a big link with genetics, isn't it? Because if you have one uh, parent who's atopic, about 50% of the kids will be atopic. If both parents are atopic, then about 80% of the children will be atopic. So there's definitely a genetic role that's being played in this. But that doesn't explain why our rates of allergy have gone up from 4% to 25% in 100 years. You know, genetics take a long time to, to change. So is it environmental? The hygiene hypothesis says if you don't get lots of infections, you don't stimulate your immune system in the correct way, and an abnormal response then makes you atopic. And there's certainly something to do with that. Pollution, nutrition, poverty, and so on, all have effects on, on allergy and other types of diseases, but they're probably more common in the developing world. So it's not so much that the industrialized world is, is, is uh, more poor or has, has more pollution necessarily. And one of the things that may be underlying this is to do with worm infestation. We talked about IgE being involved in getting rid of parasites. Now you might say, well, who's got worms? Well, a lot of people have worms. About a quarter of the world's population have worms. And back a hundred and whatever years ago, almost everyone had worms. And we talked about domestic animals, which are wormed, and wild animals that almost have, uh, almost always will have worm infestations. And worms have managed to evolve with us over millions of years to not be rejected by our immune system. How do they go about doing that? Well, they, they release a number of chemicals, one of which uh, in, is a very powerful inhibitor of IL-33, which also drives IL-5, IL-13 and so on, which are involved in the um, allergic reaction. So they, they block uh, this IL-33, which drives a lot of the inflammatory response and therefore prevents us getting rid of them. So that you damp down the, the allergic response in patients who have worms. So in some ways, they can be quite good for us in balancing our, our immune system because we've, we've been with them for millions of years. And deworming people increases the rates of allergy and also autoimmune disease too. So there's some things to look forward to with, with worm therapy, possibly in the future. So back to basics, how do we define allergic rhinitis? Well, two or more symptoms of running blocks, sneezing and itching for more than an hour a day. And we should demonstrate that the patient actually has an IgE driven allergic response, either with skin prick tests or RAST, which is radioallergosorbent. More commonly, it's now a fluorescent uh, test that's done. 
So that's how we define uh, allergic rhinitis. It's common. We said about a quarter of the population in the UK has it, and it has quite big impacts on quality of life. It doesn't hay fever doesn't kill you, but it affects your sleep. It affects schoolwork that people go to school but they haven't slept well. They're not paying attention, and the same at work. And they classify it with the area guidelines, and I'm sure you all know, which were a reasonable uh, advance in, in classification. Previously, we said seasonal and perennial, which is to do with the allergen itself, whereas now we say intermittent and persistent, which obviously is to do with the patient's symptoms, which makes a lot more sense. Mild, patients can get on with their lives. Moderate to severe, it has bad effects on them, affects their exam performance, school performance, and things at work. So I think we all know what we're talking about if we use the area classifications. But remember, if we're looking at the nose with allergic rhinitis, there's a lot of other diseases that go along with that, that are, that are part and parcel of, of, of that immune response. So asthma, a lot of our patients with allergic rhinitis will also have asthma, eczema, eye problems is, is often severe in patients with allergic rhinitis. Sinusitis and polyposis, again, things going on inside the nose, the upper and lower respiratory tract, and the tightus media in the ears. So having an allergic rhinitis may also involve a large number of other primary allergic type diseases. And along with those, we get secondary problems, the decreased quality of life, sleeping disorders, uh, uh, poor uh, functioning at school and work, as I said, and if you've got a blocked nose and you breathe through your mouth, you can get sore throats, bad breath, and, and dental problems. So allergic rhinitis is one part of this whole uh, uh, disease uh, process. A lot of patients with asthma will also have allergic rhinitis and the other way around. And it's obvious why, because they have the same mechanism. Allergic asthma and allergic rhinitis are exactly the same, might be managed in different departments, but it's the same disease process. There's the same epithelial lining, so it reacts in the same way. Uh, and if you, if you put an allergen into the nose, you can get changes in the lung. If you put it in the lungs, you can get changes in the nose. So they react uh, similarly and systemically. So what happens if you block your nose? Well, the function of the nose obviously is to, well, partly, apart from smell, as Carl's talked about, but to, to clean and warm and humidify the air that you're breathing down into your lungs and it also forms a part of the immune system. So it protects the uh, lower respiratory tract from infection and dryness and, and cold air and so on. So if your nose is blocked, then you open up the lower airways to be attacked by uh, infection and, and, and other uh, problems. If we look at the OS ratio for having poor asthma control in a patient who smokes, the odds ratio for that is 4.3. If we look at the odds ratio for a patient with significant allergic rhinitis, having poor asthma control is 4.6. So you can see that, that having significant rhinitis is very important in managing asthma because it's very likely that we'll have poor control if we don't deal with the rhinitis that's involved at the same time. So what methods have we got to manage um, allergic rhinitis? Well, We've got non-pharmacological, we've got drugs, and then we've got immunotherapy that I'm going to talk about in the second part of this uh, talk. Clearly, if we can reduce exposure to the allergen, that's going to be helpful. There's not huge evidence for these things sometimes, but it seems sensible that if you're sensitized to something to reduce your exposure to, it would make a difference. Pollen, that's difficult because it can be all around you. So grass and tree pollen is pretty ubiquitous in the different seasons being inside, being in a car with decent filtration can be helpful, but it's difficult to avoid completely. Dust mites, mattress and pillow covers and so on can drop your exposure to them. Again, there's some evidence that it may have an effect in children, poor evidence in adults perhaps, but if you've got a child with allergic asthma, allergic eczema, allergic rhinitis, it's probably worthwhile trying to make an effort to reduce exposure. With animals, the, the main thing you're sensitized to is the enzymes in animal saliva, so cats are very highly allergenic. People won't get rid of their pets, but if you can keep them out of the bedroom, that can be helpful. And then things like moulds, cockroaches and so on, is all to do with housing and managing to, to reduce exposure from that. 
Now, if we move on to um, uh, what drives the allergic reaction, well, histamine drives the early phases of the reaction. So obviously, we're going to be talking about antihistamines for that. We get uh, uh, histamine release, so we get sensory uh, nerves being triggered, causing itching and sneezing. And then we get increased vascular permeability and glands being stimulated that cause it to run. And then in the later phase, apart from histamine, we have another uh, large number of other drivers of, of inflammation that cause the nose to become blocked. So you can see from that that an antihistamine may be useful for these early uh, reactions, but it may not have such a good effect on, on blockage and managing uh, later problems. Don't forget about saline douches. They're fairly simple to use. And obviously if you've got pollen in your nose and you manage to wash it out, that's usually beneficial. Antihistamines orally to be taken regularly and topical ones that are quick acting can be useful. And topical steroids are our mainstay, aren't they, for managing allergic rhinitis because they work on a number of different symptoms that we have. More recently, there's a combined topical steroid and antihistamine Dimista that does seem to have a slightly better effect in some patients. I'll mention that just shortly. And for patients with asthma or patients with peak seasonal wheeze, particularly, then leukotriene receptor antagonists can be useful. In patients who mainly have problems with running of the nose, then an anticholinergic like the protropium can be helpful. And monoclonals are coming into their own uh, more and more. They still remain quite expensive. And if we look at how different drugs work, we can see that antihistamines, as I said, are good at sneezing and itching, but they're not much good at unblocking your nose. Whereas corticosteroids have a reasonable effect across all the different symptoms that allergic rhinitis um, produces. And um, things like chromones are very safe, but their effect is, is pretty minimal. And leukotriene receptor antagonists have some, but limited uh, effect. And they work for some patients, but not all. If we look at a combination of a nasal steroid and a nasal antihistamine in Dimista, the combination does seem to have a better effect. So that can be a useful drug if patients have been on a topical steroid that isn't having a good effect, that you can add that in and it may, it may work a little better. One of the main things to do if you're treating people is try and get them to start before the hay fever season starts because once they've got a lot of inflammation and uh, problems in their nose, it's difficult to get it to settle down again. You're much better if you can stop that big increase in inflammatory changes before the season starts. So GPs will often treat people appropriately with an antihistamine and a topical steroid. If that's not working, then you might want to add in one of these combined uh, topical antihistamine and steroids and possibly Montelukast. And if they get bad, allergic rare conjunctivitis, then a topical antihistamine can be useful too. Now, when they come up to us, obviously, these are the sort of things that people say that they've been on everything and, it's, and none of it's working. Um, if you look at how people actually use their spray, almost nobody uses it properly. And in fact, if you ask anybody how often they use their spray, people tend to use things intermittently. So it may be worth checking they're using it regularly. For some reason, some people seem to get on better with one antihistamine than another, so it may be worth changing it. Montelukast is available, particularly for patients with asthma, so it might be steroid sparing. Instead of increasing the steroid, you can trial Montelukast to see if they get some, some benefit. And as I said, if the nose runs, then Rhinotec can be useful. Occasionally, a dose of oral steroid can just open the nose up so they can actually breathe and get the topical steroid in, but obviously it has its issues. And oxymetazoline or decongestant with a topical steroid may be beneficial. And adding the topical steroid can help to stop the downregulation of the alpha receptors in the nose. So it may not have the rhinitis and medicamentosa effects that, that oxymetazoline itself would have. As I mentioned, we've got several new monoclonals coming along, like omelizumab, which binds to IgE, filumab, which is an IL-4 receptor antagonist, which are, I think, going to be more important in the future, but at the moment are, are still fairly expensive and limited in their use. Surgery can occasionally be useful if you've got a patient who's got a fixed uh, inflammatory change or fixed um, swelling of the turbinates that will not settle with decongestant or anything else. You may need to remove some of that submucosal fibrosis under the mucosa of the turbinates, 
just to get access for our topical steroids. And of course, the depot steroids that we used to use in the past are not recommended. Now, you can have a look. This is uh, the algorithm that ARIA have put, and it basically says, as I've been talking to you about, mild and antihistamine, moderate to severe, adding in uh, leukotriene receptor antagonists and steroids, and with the moderate to severe, then increasing the steroid, adding in epitropium, and various other things. And underneath all of these, they mention immunotherapy that we'll come to in a second. And the other one is the British Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, which basically says very similar things. Uh, try an antihistamine first if it's mild, intranasal steroid if it's more severe. If that fails, you can increase it and then add in the various other uh, medications that I've talked about. So to finish the first part of the talk, if you can treat the rhinitis and the asthma together, you tend to get better control of both. The basic treatment for allergic rhinitis and allergic asthma at the moment is combined topical uh, uh, nasal and inhaled uh, steroids. They work across most of the symptoms. In the future, this talk may become a bit redundant because we're going to be finding a lot more of these monoclonal antibodies that are specific for, for different patients' problems. And don't forget, there's quite a lot of research that's been done here in Dundee and in Edinburgh on worm therapy and how they manage to block various different interleukins. So that's the end of the first part, and then I'll talk less lengthily about immunotherapy. That was brilliant. Thank you, Quentin. Um, we've just got what, one question really, and it's regarding the, the safety profile of uh, intranasal ipratropium bromide in, uh, with regards to uh, kind of ocular contraindications. Is it okay to give intranasal ipratropium bromide? Uh, the example was given if someone's only got one CNI. Well, yeah, I mean, there are links with glaucoma and so on, aren't there, that people worry about. Um, I think it depends on symptoms, doesn't it? I mean, I think I would be wary about giving even steroids to patients with glaucoma unless there was a good reason for it. Speaking to the ophthalmologist, they seem to be fairly relaxed, and I've had one or two patients who they've agreed to, if I was giving them steroids or epitropium, agreed to measure pressures and so on in patients with glaucoma to make sure they don't increase. Yeah. Um, it's a balance of these things, isn't it? How severe are the symptoms? If they've got a runny nose and they've got one eye, I might say, I wouldn't give you anything that may give you a risk. Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Brilliant, okay, if we can go on to the, uh, to the second part. Okay, no problem. So I'll talk about immunotherapy. I've been involved with, with doing immunotherapy since I, did my fellowship in France with a, uh, Jean Bousquet in, in Montpellier, who was a big um, advocate of immunotherapy, he's been doing it for years. So I'll talk a little bit about the immunotherapy for the aeroallergens and also against um, venom uh, immun immunotherapy. Because as we talked about, the way that we treat allergies at the moment with antihistamines, with steroids and so on, it doesn't really get to the bottom of the problem. It blocks the inflammatory mediators that are being released, um, steroids in the, in the uh, cell nucleus and antihistamines once it's been released, but it doesn't actually change the disease. And a lot of patients who we treat still have significant symptoms despite giving them all the drugs that we have. And immunotherapy is a treatment that really changes uh, the disease quite profoundly. So we talk about desensitization, which perhaps isn't a very good name for it, but tolerance to the allergens is, is a better way of what we're looking for. We can change the disease so that we, once we've treated a patient, even when we stop treatment, their symptoms remain well controlled. We can try and stop what's called the allergic MART, so allergic eczema, going on to allergic rhinitis, going on to allergic asthma. So you might want to treat younger uh, patients with allergic eczema with uh, immunotherapy to try and prevent the disease going on. And with treatment, we can really get the disease into remission for, for a long period of time and reduce the symptoms very significantly. So for the aeroallergens, it's indicated in the UK certainly, really for patients who have severe symptoms despite being on maximum uh, medical treatment. So how does it work? Well, as we mentioned, allergic disease is driven by IgE. And we've also got um, T helper cells, TH2 cells, that are, that are uh, activated in patients with allergic rhinitis. So uh, what immunotherapy does is it changes the way that the, the B cells respond. So normally the B cells are 
pumping out um, IgE that's binding to the allergen and then getting onto the antigen presenting cell, triggering changes in the T cells to give us uh, allergic disease. And you find increased production of blocking IgGs that stop those allergen IgE complexes being formed. So you don't keep on triggering the, the immune response. As I said, that stops the uh, TH0 cells being transformed into TH2 active TH2 cells that drive the immune response. And if I can show you that in a diagram, what it does. So the blue is the placebo and the green and the brown are different methods of immunotherapy that we'll talk about shortly. Over time, so year one, year two, your IgE levels drop very significantly with immunotherapy. The um, IgG levels, these blocking uh, IgG antibodies, increase substantially and are activated T cells that are driving the immune response. Also, specific uh, cells drop significantly too, and this goes off in the long term. So does it actually work? Well, lots of studies have been done, and in general, if you look at the forest plot, uh, if it's to the left of the line, that means that there's a, a, a positive uh, effect of the treatment. And you can see that throughout many, many of these studies, there is a very good positive response of symptom control in patients who've undergone the immunotherapy. This is a study that we were involved in a number of years ago with grass pollen that was trying to titrate how, what, what quantity, what strength of, of grass pollen extract should be used. And in the patients there, about they dropped their symptoms by a third and the medication use in allergic rhinitis over the season by a half. And you might say, well, dropping your symptoms by a third doesn't sound that much, but compared to almost all treatments that we give patients, that's a massive uh, effect uh, in symptom reduction. So the practical aspects of it, there's two main types of immunotherapy. One is subcutaneous and the other is sublingual. Subcutaneous, you need to get multiple injections, usually starting with a very tiny dose and increasing it gradually over weeks to get to a larger dose. And more often we're seeing now is sublingual immunotherapy, which either involves very rapid or no updosing, and it's taken the first tablet with under supervision, and then it can be taken by the patient at home. You need to check IgE either by skin prick testing or measuring levels to make sure that the, uh, the treatment you're giving them is, is specific to the thing that they are sensitized to. And it's worth check, checking their tryptase levels too, because those patients with uh, mastocytosis, for example, may have uh, more likelihood of reacting to your immunotherapy. But equally, you might say you would give them immunotherapy at a lower threshold because they're more likely to react to it. That certainly goes along with venom immunotherapy. Treatment's usually for three years. A lot of work done to say if you do it for two years, the symptoms may come back, but three years often gives long lasting uh, uh, reduction in symptoms. And for grass pollen, for example, when we give treatment, it's about a thousand times as much as you would get in your nose. And for venom, equal to approximately two stings. So if I talk about venom immunotherapy, because it, it's similar to the immunotherapy for all the treatments that we give. So honeybees and bumblebees, the venom is the same. Wasps and hornets, the venom is the same, but they're, they're very different between bees and wasps. What do you need? Well, you certainly need an anaphylaxis kit because that's the thing that you're scared of triggering. So you need to have adrenaline, an antihistamine injectable and steroids that you can inject if the patient reacts badly. And we can desensitize or induce tolerance in many different uh, areas of allergens. So for wasp venom, this is an older one for bee venom, for dogs, cats, grass, various other things that we can use. When you're giving an injection, then you give a deep subcutaneous injection. As you can see there, you put the needle in, you withdraw to make sure it's not intravascular, then you give half the dose in, withdraw again, make sure it's not intravascular, and then take it back out. And if you're injecting and withdrawing, there's blood in the syringe, you remove it because you're much more likely, obviously, to get an anaphylactic reaction if you inject intravascularly. With Grazax or a Carazax or Orovac, as I said, the patient takes the first tablet under supervision. They very frequently get quite a lot of itching in their mouth and in their nose and in their eyes, but that gradually subsides usually over the first two weeks. And there's no reason for them not to take an antihistamine 45 minutes or so before they take the Brazax tablet to try and reduce those symptoms. It doesn't affect the, the way that the uh, treatment works. And there's very good uptake by the um, uh, 
antigen presenting cells in the mucosa of uh, immunotherapy taken sublingually. Patients, it's, it's easy to take. As I said, Grazax, Carizax for house dust mite, and the Orovac uh, sublingual can be made as you wish it. So if it's a patient allergic to cat and grass, they can put that together, or you know, cat and dog and tree, they can put that together. They can make it as you want it. It's a, a patient-specific uh, immunotherapy treatment. So with venom, if they get an allergic reaction, you can get localized reactions that are not uncommon, then more severe reactions where patients feel unwell and have more systemic problems, and then ones that become a little bit more, more dangerous. Bees tend to give a big dose of venom, and therefore generally will provoke a worse reaction, but you're unlikely to be stung by a bee unless you're a beekeeper. Wasps can sting multiple times. They give a small dose of venom, but again, a large number of wasps can sting you and they're more likely to sting you than, than a bee is. So a localized reaction like this, it's unpleasant, but an antihistamine will usually settle that down. You don't need much more treatment than that. With more severe reactions, people can be, get tightness of the chest, they can feel unwell, and the severe ones then obviously where they have cardiorespiratory problems or collapse are the ones that we would probably want to see. So basic treatment, an oral antihistamine, in a lot of places people would be treated just with an adrenaline, an EpiPen injector to take with them. But in the patients that we see who are either beekeepers usually, who are getting more severe reactions, so asthma, angioedema, but in, they're very likely to be stung again, those are people we would treat. And patients with a systemic reaction who collapse or have cardiorespiratory problems are definitely the people that we would want to see and treat. Um, I'm just coming to an end now. Previously, we used to give weekly injections for 12 weeks and then every six weeks for about three <laughs> years. <laughs> That's not me. Um, to try and get long term. Uh, <laughs> But now we can uh, do an ultra rush treatment with venomal, so we admit the patient, and over two days, no, no, frequent injection no, 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 no. to get up to the maintenance. My Italian's improving, I think. Uh, and then every six weeks for three years. It's very, very effective. Patients who have been wasp venom uh, allergy, 90 to 95% of them treated will have very little reaction if they're stung again. And that can be life changing for patients who are scared to go outside in the summertime. And that's it. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Quentin. That was uh, a great talk in, a, in an area that I don't think we get an awful lot of exposure to uh, in ENT, especially with the immunotherapy. Just a, a question from uh, Gemma, just saying in a patient who's got multiple allergies, how many allergens would you consider offering immunotherapy for? And is it given by ENT or an immunologist? Uh, well, that would depend on the department. And um, with us, it's given some is given by ENT and some is given by immunology, but that's historical with us. Um, I think mainly in a lot of places, it'd be given by uh, an, an immunologist. Yeah. In America, they would give you, we get quite a lot of um, students in St Andrews who come over who are being given uh, allergen immunotherapy, and they sometimes have multiple allergens to be injected in one vial. The trouble is, if they then react to one, you don't know which one of that concoction of allergens they've reacted to. So in the UK, it would be normal to give one uh, allergen immunotherapy at a time, and you might want to do one subsequently. For the sublingual, as I mentioned, the oral vac, you can use several at a time. But in the UK, for the injectable ones, it would usually be one at a time. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you, Quentin. So thank you very much for that talk. That was, uh, that was great. And, uh...